Thank you. So um, what I'd like to do is uh, give a talk about the principle of self-organization and how it is a wonderful model for creating truly uh, sustainable human systems. So I'm going to be doing this in an ecological sort of framework and then moving into to human systems at the end of the talk. Now, as we came into the 20th century, a lot of people doing research in various disciplines, things like psychology, anthropology, sociology, biology, ecology, cybernetics, we're finding that our sort of traditional Western paradigm for doing research through linear reductionism wasn't working for them. And by the middle of the 20th century, a lot of these researchers from various disciplines came together and started sharing notes. And what they realized was that the phenomena they were seeing in their respective disciplines was basically the same. They were looking at feedback loops, emergent properties, and so by the latter half of the 20th century, they started to bring together a unified body of theory called complex system science, and within that was embedded the principle of self-organization. Now, what self-organization is, it's a process that, when a, as a system grows, if it's going to self-organize, it doesn't just get bigger, it gets more complex. And that complexity is derived from the parts within the system becoming ever more specialized through time and tightly integrated together, such that each part doing what it needs to do to sustain itself creates conditions that sustain the whole. And as a result, these self-organizing systems grow increasingly resilient, stable, and efficient. So that was quite a bit right there. So I'm going to go through that one more time just to reinforce it. So self-organization, a process that as a system grows, it not only gets bigger, but more complex. The complexity derived from the parts becoming ever more specialized and tightly integrated together, with each part doing what it needs to do to sustain itself, creating conditions that sustain the whole. And as a result, these systems grow resilient, stable, and efficient. Now, our bodies are wonderful examples of self-organization. Uh, we all started life as a single microscopic cell, and now our bodies have over 30 trillion cells. And during our developmental phase, that one cell didn't just multiply to 30 trillion, the cells started to differentiate. So now we have 254 different kinds of cells in our bodies, you know, skin cell, muscle cell, nerve cells, bone cells. But the specialization in our cells goes even further. So some nerve cells just communicate with a sensory cell. Other nerve cells just communicate with a muscle cell. Other neurons link sensory neurons to motor neurons. So our cells are incredibly specialized, but luckily for us, they're tightly integrated together so that each cell, cell doing what it needs to do to sustain itself creates conditions that sustain the whole. And as a result, our bodies are incredibly stable. You go in the interior body environment right at 98.6, blood sugar held very carefully, pH very carefully controlled, and we're resilient. If we uh, get sick or wounded, we heal. But I'd like to um, really show how this process of self-organization works in ecosystems. I'm an ecologist, so that's where I naturally go. Um, how it works through ecosystems through evolutionary time to create systems that become ever more resilient and stable and efficient. Now, in the natural world, um, the bottom line currency is energy. And this is a rock hard currency, and it's also finite. So natural selection is al always pushing species to become more energy efficient because any organism or population that develops an adaptation or strategy that makes them more energy efficient means they'll be able to support a larger population on the same finite amount of energy. However, if organisms start moving towards energy inefficiency, natural selection starts taking them out of the picture. And as you're going to see, this process of pushing species towards energy efficiency is going to make species become more specialized and tightly integrated with other members of their ecological community. Now, for a while now, ecologists have been saying we shouldn't be moving species from one part of the world to another, because when we do that, we create these young ecological interactions, which are usually very energy inefficient and often quite um, harmful for the species involved. So let me just give you an example of this. In 1904, um, chestnut blight fungus was accidentally introduced into North America. Now, at that time, the American chestnut was the most common forest tree east of the Mississippi River. 
Uh, in the heart of its range, places like Tennessee and Kentucky, American chestnut grew to immense sizes. We have pre-blight uh, photographs of trees up to 14 feet in diameter, so that's about the width of the stage I'm standing on. Um, they grew to almost 200 feet in height. They produced the most edible nut of any tree in North America, and it only took that fungus about 30 years to almost completely eradicate the species. Now, that was obviously a really bad outcome for the American chestnut, but I'd like you to contemplate the fungus. If you are a host-specific parasite, the worst thing you could do is annihilate your host, because if you've done that, you have just annihilated yourself. Now, that was an incredibly energy inefficient thing for that fungus to do. It would have been much better served if it didn't kill off its host tree. It would have lived longer, it would have reproduced more, there would have been more of a resource out there for its offspring to live on, so a really bad move. But if two species do not extinguish each other, and these two species have not extinguished each other yet in North America, natural selection kicks into gear and starts forcing them to adjust their ecologies to be more energy efficient. And that means that these relationships can co-evolve from something like a predation, which is what the fungus was doing to its trees, it was just killing them, right up to a mutualism that's beneficial for both species involved and often obligatory for their survivorship. So my favorite example of this uh, involves the bull's horn acacia tree and its resident Azteca acacia ant. These are two species that live down in Central America. Through their co-evolved time together, uh, the bull's horn acacia has developed three features to service its ants. The first is the thorns that used to ward off herbivores have now become huge and pliable. And they no longer protect the tree, but the ants drill into them, hollow them out, and that's where they raise their young. Secondly, on every leaf stem are these open sap wells where the ants will go to drink, and that's where they get their liquid as well as their carbohydrate energy resource. And then around the margins of all the leaves are these little globules called belchian bodies, which the ants harvest for their nutrition and they grow back. Uh, the ants have become so specialized, the acacia, they can only survive on belchian bodies and acacia sap. If they are removed from their tree, they will be dead in 24 hours' time. But in return, they give their tree the most advanced plant defense system of any tree in the world. They have a very venomous sting that wards off all herbivores. Those trees never get munched on at all. But not only that, if vines try to crawl up the trunk of an acacia, the ants will come down, they will chop through those vines and kill them. If surrounding trees try to encroach in the acacia's space, the ants will go into those trees and defoliate them. Now, if you remove the acacia ants from their host tree, it will be defoliated in about a month's time. So these two species are in this very mutually beneficial interaction that's obligatory. But what's marvelous about this example is we know from the mandibular structure of the ants that they're derived from leafcutter ants. So way back when, when the ancestral leafcutter ant and the ancestral acacia tree first came together in their young ecological interaction, it probably wasn't a very pretty sight. Uh, trees might have been being stripped with their leaves and killed, which was not a very energy efficient thing to do, and somehow natural selection kicked it in gear and started forcing these species to adjust their ecologies right up to this present day mutualism. Now, another ecological interaction is between species is competition. And this is looked at differently in ecology than we often look at it. We often think of competition being a good thing, but in the natural world, uh, competition between two species is a negative, negative interaction. It harms both parties because they're using energy uh, in their competitive struggles. If they can actually come up with strategies where they can coexist without competing, they get an energy boost. So natural selection will push them to do this through something that is called niche separation. And what a species niche is, it's sort of its, its total ecological role. It's all of its adaptations, all of its interactions, everything. Matter of fact, it would be way too complex to define the niche of any one species. So ecologists break it down. We look at things like the foraging niche, something that's a lot easier to get a handle on. Uh, so you might say, all right, how does, how does this organism go about getting its food? Well, in niche separation, um, one way that species can separate their niches to not compete is what's called temporal separation, 
where they're just active at different times, like owls at night and hawks during the day. They can coexist without competing and get the energy boost by doing that. Another way to do it is they can take their habitat where they live and break it up into micro habitats, um, subsets of the habitat where they will forage. Uh, so our black-capped chickadees do this by just foraging insects off of branches, while at the same time, white-breasted nuthatches have specialized to just forage on the trunks of trees. And in this way, those two species of birds can be foraging at the exact same time and not compete at all through their specialization. Or a third way they can do this, uh, Darwin's finches do this down in the Galapagos, is they have um, developed resource partitioning. So you get these mixed flocks of finches that are all foraging together, and the large beak finch just eats large seeds, and the small beak finch just eats small seeds, and in this way, again, they can coexist without the energy losses of competition. Now, so what is happening here is, driven by energy efficiency, natural selection is forcing species to become more specialized, and as you can see, the examples I just gave are all showing the species have become more specialized, which means the size of their niches shrink, which means through time, ecosystems can support more and more and more species, which boosts the repetition of function of critical roles. And that might not sound like such a great thing, but that repetition of function is the key to the resiliency of these systems. So I want you to just picture um, a wildflower meadow around here, here in New Hampshire somewhere, all the way through the bloom season from, you know, right in May all the way through November. And if you were to go out and catalog how many different insect pollinators you could find out there, you'd find well over a thousand species through that whole blooming season. All these different species of moths, butterflies, bees, flies, beetles, ants, all pollinating at different times of the season, different time of the day and night, in different ways, so they can all coexist. And all that repetition of function, what it does is, if any one of those species should go extinct, that pollination system is just fine. Because there's so many others doing the exact same critical role. And so all of the critical roles out in the natural world were to find very robust repetition of fun function. We don't just have a handful of decomposing species, we've got thousands of them. We don't just have a handful of photosynthetic plants, we've got hundreds and hundreds of them. And again, that's what, gives up the, that's what brings up the resiliency and stability because if any one species should go extinct, the system is just fine. So what we see in, with self-organization is that it's pushing systems to decentralize critical roles. Whenever we start moving towards concentration of critical roles, we start moving away from resiliency and stability. So let me just give you three examples uh, of human systems where this, you can see this at play. So I want you to picture Detroit, Detroit, Michigan. Back in 1980, the bulk of the jobs in that city were with General Motors. And then through the next two decades, as General Motors started faltering and started losing jobs, the result in Detroit was devastating. Detroit, within 20 years, lost over one half its human population, leaving tens of thousands of vacant buildings that had to be destroyed and leaving their city bankrupt and their economy just in shambles because there had been way too much concentration in the job market with just one corporate entity. Uh, another example, take the Central Valley of California right now. Due to use of pesticides there for, for so many years, there are no longer any native pollinators. So the bulk of the produce grown in this country, fruits, vegetables, nuts, are all pollinated by one species, the honeybee. And I think as many of you know, the honeybee is not doing that well. If something should happen that takes the honeybee out, that system collapses overnight, because now we're down to ultimate concentration with just one party. And of course, another example would be the financial meltdown of 2008. Now, many people think the reason for that meltdown was risky investments, but risky investments were the catalyst. The underlying reason for that, that big failure was that so much of the banking assets in this country were held in very few banks, something like 54% of all the banking assets were held in just 10 banks. And those banks were big, and they're all involved in the same sorts of investment schemes, and once Lehman Brothers bellied up, 
If the federal government hadn't stepped in and shored up the rest of the system, it would have gone as a cascade through that system collapsing it. So I'm just pointing out here that there are risks when we start to really concentrate. Now, I should mention, uh, Western scientists may be the last people, or people that really ever came upon this notion of self-organization because it was actually written about over 200 years before Western science came across this principle in a wonderful book that was published in 1776 called The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. And if you are familiar with Smith, then you'll know he's considered the father of economic theory. Now at that time, Smith was looking at these pre-industrial merchant economies. And the thing that really intrigued him was that you had all these merchants doing what they're doing out of their own self-interest, but without anyone orchestrating it, they were creating a network of relationships that were mutually beneficial. So what he was writing about, he was writing about self-organization, but he called it the invisible hand of the economy. So here you have the butcher and the blacksmith and the baker and the brewer all doing what they're doing to make money, but the blacksmith is making knives that get sold to the butcher, who in turn is butchering meat that gets sold back to the blacksmith, and then you have this robust, interactive, an integrated sort of network of relationships. Now, if you look at those merchants, they were specialized and integrated together. But if you look at our economy today, you're gonna to see we have moved in an entirely different direction towards very much towards concentration. Um, any sector we wanna look at, whether it's agriculture, energy, media, retail, financial, pharmaceutical, you're going to see that the bulk of the capital is running through just a handful of very large corporate enterprises. And I can assure you, these corporate enterprises are not uh, specialists. You look at a Walmart, they're generalists. They, you know, Walmart sells everything. And they're not very interested in integrating with others in their sector. Uh, they would just as soon dominate their sector through competitive exclusion or mergers or acquisitions. So self-organization becomes a really good scientific rationale for re-regionalizing and re-localizing economies. Now, I'm not suggesting we get rid of large corporations or end global trade or anything like that, but I think we've moved way too far in that direction, and I think we need to move back if we truly want to create resilient, stable economies that will service us all much better. And not only that, if we do that, if we move back towards uh, relocalizing and re-regionalizing economies, then we get the benefits of having that economic system be much more environmentally sound and much more socially just. Now, I don't have the time to explain how self-organization is going to do that because I plan this talk to be just 15 minutes. So I'm going to stop and I'll let you contemplate how self-organization does that. Well, thank you very much.